It is so important to worship together. And, you know, when, when you are feeling down, what the scriptures say, put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Well, it's not just talk. When you focus your mind on Jesus, when you look at him, it makes a real difference in your world. Because all of a sudden, all these things that are so worrying, so concerning, when you stack them up next to the almighty God of the universe, maybe they're not such a big deal. You look at this psalm that Mary read us in verse 2 there. It says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. The earth's about as solid as you can get. And when that falls away, you've got problems happening. And yet we don't have to fear because even should the earth fall from out under our feet, God is still in control. He is on his throne and he, we can do nothing to get out of his control, out of his hand. Amen? All right, that's a freebie for you. Well, I'm sure glad to be able to be here. And let's pray and we'll get into the passage for today. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. I thank you for each one of these students who have come to learn from you, to grow in their ability to minister, to serve. I ask that as we open the word and we look to you today, you would change our hearts. You would shape our minds, that we would draw closer to you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. All of us have times when we have to make choices. Have you ever had those? All of you have come to school here, so you at least had one big choice to make. As Dr. Booth said, when I showed up here, I, I had to make choices. And I'd heard about these crazy Southern Baptists, you know. I had all sorts of ideas about who they were and what they were going to be. And I came onto campus here, and the first thing that happened at 8 o'clock in the morning was the president, Dr. Blackaby, stopped the year-end board meeting with all these important people to come out and shake my hand. And I went, boy, that's, that's really special. These people really love you. And indeed, they do love you here. But we've all had choices like that, where we've had to figure out what we're going to do, how we're going to look at the world, how we're going to respond to the world, or what we're going to do when we make mistakes or do things wrong. And today I want to study the stories of two different men who were given opportunities to respond to correction respond to the recognition of something that had gone wrong in their life and the choices they made around that. So begin with me in 1 Samuel 13. Dr. Watson's going to hate me. I have three different passages today. Normally I don't do that, but at least I did a Baptist 3, so he'll sort of forgive me. In 1 Samuel 13, we have the story of Saul going to fight the Philistines. He'd been king for a year, and he'd reign, or sorry, he'd been one year, and then became king and reigned for two years over Israel. And he had 3,000 men of Israel. And they went, he blew the trumpet, they fought against the Philistines, and then the Philistines came to attack him. They mustered to fight Israel, and there were 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, troops like the sand on the seashore in multitudes, and they came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of Beth-Avon. And all the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed. And all the men of Israel remembered, wait a second, I think I left the oven on. I have to go. I'll be back. Let me know when the Philistines are gone. All the men of Israel were scared and they hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews even went so far as to cross the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And Saul was still at Gilgal and the people around him were trembling. This is the opening moment. There was a crisis at hand. Saul had blown the trumpet, had stood up against the Philistines in the name of God, and the Philistines had come out to play. And all of a sudden, what seemed like a really good idea at the time started to seem less so as everybody looked at the numbers against them and started to disappear, started to remember other things they had to do that day. I mean, that happens to the best of us, right? The dog needs to get washed sometimes. And so Saul was waiting for seven days for the appointed time. He was waiting for Samuel to come to give a sacrifice so that the blessing of the Lord could be given to the people so that they could go out and fight. But Samuel wasn't coming and the people were starting to scatter. There was this pressure that was on Saul. There was a need that was there. He had to do something. He was the king. He was the leader. He had to make a decision. 
And he felt this fear that things weren't going right. And if he didn't solve the problem himself, everything would be lost. So he said, bring the burnt offering to here, here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he'd finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel showed up. Boy, talk about bad timing, eh? Like getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar, you know. I used to have this happen when I was supposed to clean the house and I wouldn't get around to doing it and I'd be enjoying my life and having fun and then I'd look out the window and here's mom. We had a fairly long road and I could see her coming from a ways off. Oh no! And we'd quickly be running around trying to get it ready. Well, this was Saul. He's standing there, knife on sacrifice, caught dead, doing what he shouldn't have done, doing what he did out of fear and here's Samuel coming. He had sinned and now he was caught. So I wonder how he was going to respond. Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Hey, how's it going? Nothing to see here. All's good, right? And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me, that you didn't come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, the Philistines will come down against me at, the Lord, at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself. I didn't want to do it, Samuel. I didn't want to do the wrong thing. I didn't want to sin, but you didn't show up. You didn't do your part, so I had to. The Philistines were coming. What was I supposed to do as a good king? So I took the bullet and I sacrificed. I sinned, but there was a darn good reason. And I shouldn't be held to, to account for it. I offered that burnt offering and Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal, and the rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army, and they went on. And it goes on, he numbered the people they fought. But here we have an opening story of Saul refusing to trust God, of Saul feeling the weight of leadership, the burden of command, seeing a situation that seemed wrong and problematic, and his answer was to step up and do something he knew was wrong. He didn't trust God and instead tried to do things himself. And he fell into sin. Now, all of you guys are, are preparing for ministry in some way or shape. You're going to have leadership. So pay attention to this. Some of this stuff may seem kind of junior grade. Oh, well, you shouldn't sin. But think about this. We all do. And when the weight of leadership is upon us, when the pressure of decision making is there, when we have things that we're supposed to do, people who are clamoring for a decision, it's very easy to forget God to forget trust, to blame others, and then to step up to make a human decision instead of rest in God. Saul tried to fake it on this one. He tried to pretend that there was nothing wrong. That was his first response when he was convicted of sin, when he knew he'd done something wrong. He walked up and he said, hey, nothing to see here. Everything's fine, Samuel. How are you doing? And then he blamed everyone and everything around him the circumstances that he was in as the cause of his sin. He even blamed the prophet of God who had anointed him king over Israel and said, it's your fault I sinned because you didn't happen to be in the right place at the right time. He would not recognize that he was responsible for his sin. And he lost the kingdom. That was the consequences of this sin. He'd lost his right to the kingdom. Another king had been raised up already. He'd lost so much because he decided that he would try to protect his kingdom his way. So there's story number one. Saul had an opportunity to do what was right, and instead he blamed others. He didn't trust God. He refused to admit his sin. And we find him in chapter 15, still fighting the enemies of the Lord. In chapter, chapter 15, Samuel came to Saul and he said, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel, and you are the king. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. 
Thus said the lords of hosts, I've noted that Amalek did to Israel, or what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. So go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Now let me make this really clear, Saul. Don't spare them. Kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That's a really precise list of instructions, isn't it? Saul, go kill the enemies of God. And here's who I want you to kill, just in case you don't know, just in case you might be confused, just in case you think maybe uh, he only meant a tenth. Kill everybody. Wipe them out for what they've done. This is because of how they stood against God. So Saul obeyed. He summoned the people. He numbered them in Telaim, and there was 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. And the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Wait a second. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And he devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. I think things are starting to come off the rails. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves, of the lambs and all that was good, and they would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, though, they devoted to destruction. Saul was doing really well. He went, he gathered the people of Israel. He went to obey the Lord. But as he was in the process of obeying the Lord, there was just too much good stuff there not to take a little bit. There was just too much prestige and pride to not to, ki to keep the king of the Amalekites. He couldn't resist being a king like the other nations had, getting the spoil, getting the plunder, getting the trophy, a man to sit at his table so he could point and say, I defeated that king who was once strong and proud. He couldn't resist. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel and he said, I regret that I've made Saul king for he's turned back from following me. He's not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and cried to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told to him, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. And then he turned and he passed on and he went down to Gilgal. First, Saul had had a problem with seeing too much spoil and booty that he couldn't overlook it. And then Saul had looked at this battle that he had just won. And instead of seeing the work of the Lord and the greatness of God, he'd said, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty capable. I think I deserve some sort of recognition for all that I've done by the might of my hand. And Saul built a monument to himself. And so Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, for I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You start seeing a bit of a pattern with Saul, don't you? Hey, how's it going? Nothing to see here. I finished the job. <laughs> and Samuel said to Saul, What's that that I'm hearing? What's this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, the lowing of the oxen that I hear? And Saul said, Well, you have to understand, they brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, it's okay. They spared them. They're going to die. It's going to happen. We just have to do it later because we want to make a big show and sacrifice. It's all good. Nothing to worry about. It's their fault. I tried to stop them. I'm only the king. What could I do? But we're trying to get this situation under control. They'll be dead soon. And the rest we've devoted to destruction. We saved all of that stuff. But I promise you, if there was an old runty pig, it's dead. And really dead. Like, it's okay, we did what God commanded us to do. And Samuel said to Saul, stop. 
I'll tell you what the Lord told me last night. And Saul said, Speak. Samuel said, Though you were little in the eyes, in your own eyes, are you not the head over all the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. The Lord sent you on a mission. And he said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, you've got it wrong. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. What's the issue, Samuel? I did what I was supposed to do, but you have to understand. The people took the spoil. They took the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. It wasn't me. Samuel, I did all that I was supposed to do. Okay, get behind the curtain there. I did what I was supposed to do. I'm righteous. I'm good. You can't point to the law. You can't point to that command that God said and say, well, I didn't follow it perfectly. Come on, 90% still passes, right? Most of us as students appreciate that. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To listen to God is better than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. Well, that's a good start. I've sinned for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. But you have to understand it's because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. It's not my fault. Okay, okay, I sinned, but I couldn't help it because the people are scary. I couldn't help it because I was worried about my poll numbers. I couldn't help it because how was I supposed to stand against all of them? I'm just the king. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin. Return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Then Samuel said to Saul, I won't return with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord. You haven't gone 90% of the way. You haven't done part of the job. You haven't done most of it. You've rejected the word of the Lord. And so the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should regret. And Saul said, I've sinned, yet honor me now before the people and before Israel. Return with me that I may bow down before the Lord. I get that I've sinned, but you have to understand what matters to me is my image. So don't walk away because people might think I'm not good enough. Don't walk away because people might realize that I've done something wrong. Stand next to me so I can put on a good face. Okay, fine, fine, fine. I've sinned. But let's make sure we keep face about it. And Samuel did return back with him. And Saul bowed before the Lord. And then Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully, fearing, thinking that the bitterness of death had passed. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Samuel went his way, Saul went his, and Samuel didn't see Saul again until after the day of his death. And Samuel grieved over Saul because this man who had been God's anointed, who'd been the leader, had given in to pride, had not trusted God, had not surrendered to God in his life, but instead had made excuses for sin, blamed other people, cared more about his own image in front of people than he did about his walk with God and whether he was rejecting God. 
And Samuel was sad. This is one way to deal with sin and our problems. When sin comes up, we can be like Saul. We can be more concerned about our image, about our pride, about how we look before people. We can be more concerned about whether we can keep people on our side and have everyone happy and everyone feeling like we've done the right thing. We can be more concerned about what we'll get out of life and what it'll do for our physical wealth or our our satisfaction in life. We can try to make things okay by convincing God that what he says is wrong is actually right. But it never produces righteousness. It never produces walk with him. It won't draw you closer to God. When we do these things, we create separation in our relationship with God. God will not plea bargain over sin. If you reject the word of the Lord, you are rejecting the word of the Lord. There's no halfway, second route, other option. You can't tell God what the rules are. God is God. And when we sin, we have to repent. The result of Saul's sin, of his trying to keep up his published public image, of his repentance with qualifiers, yes, 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 I've sinned, but here's a good reason why, is he lost everything. He was left not only with no kingdom, but with no dynasty. He was left in torment, losing the best, closest man of God that he had in Samuel, someone he would never see again. He lost everything and ended up falling on his own sword on a hill, tormented by demons for the rest of his life because he would not admit that he was wrong. This is one path that we can take. Turn with me now to 2 Samuel. In chapter 12. You guys all know the story of David and Bathsheba. David had gone out to walk on his roof when he should have been out fighting battles. He hadn't done what he was supposed to do as a good king should, but he decided to take it easy. And as he was taking it easy, as he was slacking off from his work, he fell into sin. He saw a beautiful woman that was not his wife. He took her. He lay with her. She became pregnant. He did murder to cover up his adultery, and he kept it all under wraps. It seemed like things were quiet and like everything was cool. And we come to chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, where David is sitting there, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him, and he told them the story of two men in a certain city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe that he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him with his children. It used to eat of his morsels and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. And there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled. Against this man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Now, David was the man after God's own heart. David had sinned, but you know he wasn't sitting there feeling like everything was okay. You know it was eating at him to know that he had done such terrible things, and he'd kept it quiet, he'd kept it silent. How do we know how he was feeling? He wrote in Psalm 51, and he said, when he was silent, his soul ached within him. He couldn't stand it, but he was afraid to tell people, because this was a stoning offense. This was two capital offenses. Murder and adultery deserved death, and there was no caveats in the law of God for, hey, if you're the king, you get to get away with it. Hey, if you're the king, if you're the leader, if you're the one that everyone looks to, you get a lesser sentence. Apparently, it wasn't Canada. He was able, or he knew that he, more than anyone else, was to be held accountable for what he had done. In fact, as the king, he'd had the job of handwriting his own copy of the law of God. And it says in his own writings that he meditated upon that law day and night. He knew what he had done. 
He knew he had no excuse. He knew he couldn't look and say, well, Uriah was in the wrong place at the wrong time. If he'd stuck home with his wife, this never would have happened. He couldn't say, well, if she hadn't been out there bathing when I was walking on the roof, this never would have happened. He had no excuse and he knew it. But he also knew he would die. So Nathan said to David, you are this man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the house or out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added to you as much more again. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? to do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you've despised me. You've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and I will give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with them, with your wives in the sight of the sun. You did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. So here's the point where David had the opportunity to deploy his excuses. Here's the point where David could try to make amends, to fix it on his own. Here's a point where he could say, well, God, you don't understand. Don't take away my kingdom. Don't do this because there's a good reason. Take my side. See my view. Listen to my part of the story before you just rush off into judgment. Aren't you supposed to be slow to anger, God? Come on. But what did David say? He said, I have sinned against the Lord period. I have done what is wrong, full stop. David knew his sin, and David was a man after God's own heart, and David said, I have sinned. Now, this was an admission of guilt that meant death. This was him saying, you've got me. And I should be dragged out right now and stoned. But he didn't make excuses. He didn't try to plea bargain. He didn't try to say, I'm sorry, I'll try to do something to cover it up. He admitted his sin. And Nathan said, you shall not die. The Lord has put away your sin. Nevertheless, because by this deed you've utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And Nathan went from his house. David had that opportunity to do the same that Saul did. To blame other people. To hide his sin. To find ways to get around it. But instead, when confronted with his sin, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. We get that fuller picture in Psalm 51 as he talks about this. Against you and you only have I sinned. He says, he saw what he had done. So what does this teach us today? We have these two paths, these two options. How do we avoid being a Saul? How do we avoid walking the way we shouldn't? Well, first, pride is deadly, but humility sets us free. You're not too big. You're not too powerful. You're not too important. The organization can survive without you. Confess. Be humble. The blame game never works. God does not allow us to pass the buck for sin. If we have sinned, it wasn't circumstances, it's us. And that won't change. My people in my church aren't the result or the cause of my sin. My wife didn't do it. It was me. Get used to it. You are responsible for choosing to sin in your life. Admit it. Don't ever try to pretend that you have not sinned. Don't ever try to plea bargain or to massage things and say, well, it's not actually sin because reasons. Sin is sin is sin is sin. And Dr. Peacock and Dr. Booth will tell you that in Greek and Hebrew, sin is still sin. Sin has consequences when, even when we repent. Don't sin. 
because just because God will forgive you, just because you can repent and indeed have your sins washed away eternally, it doesn't mean that the consequences for what you've done on this earth don't stay with you. If you kill somebody, they're still dead. If you attack somebody, if you hurt somebody, if you lash out at somebody in anger, if you say an unkind word, think an unkind thought, these things have consequences on this earth, and you still have to deal with it. Just because David didn't have to die didn't mean his son didn't die. Just because David didn't have to die didn't mean he didn't have to go through Absalom watching his own son rebel against him and try to destroy his kingdom. He had pain and suffering and a sword that never left his family because he chose to do something he knew was wrong. And the most important thing to take from this is repent. Repent. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, when others in the body of Christ point out an area where we've gotten off track, we should not hide. We should not pretend. We should not blame others. But we must repent. First John tells us that if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These two kings gave us an example. We have two paths we can follow. We can run and hide. Or we can repent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. For this example that we have. I thank you for the man after God's own heart who was not perfect. Who sinned greatly. And yet who came to you and who repented and who showed us the way to be free. And to walk on in relationship with you. Help us, O oh God, to walk with you. Never to be too big, too important, too proud to come humbly before your throne every day as a child who needs you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.